okay. What's the most amazing sight you've ever seen? Maybe you've gazed at the Rocky Mountains. Maybe you've witnessed the northern lights. Maybe you've seen the sunset or sunrise over the ocean. Maybe you've witnessed a tornado. Maybe it's your kid's first home run. Maybe it's their first soccer goal. Maybe it's their uh, first place finish in a contest or a perfect performance of a musical piece. Maybe it's the birth of your kids or the smile of a grandchild. Maybe it's looking into the eyes of your spouse. Perhaps it could be watching Nathan host Family Feud at camp. I don't know. What's the most amazing thing you've ever seen? What about this? What's the craziest experience you've ever had? Whitewater rafting in Colorado? Maybe it's a roller coaster ride at Six Flags. Perhaps you've gone on a trip to Europe or maybe Central America to China, even Jerusalem. Maybe it's eating your wife's lasagna and her gooey chocolate chip cookies. Have you ever jumped out of an airplane? Have you ever been bungee jumping? Maybe it's front row seats at your favorite concert or your favorite band. What's the craziest experience you've ever had? Maybe that question is best left unanswered. I like this game. Can I ask one more question? If you can meet anybody, past or present, who would you want to meet? Would it be a politician? No, thanks. Would it be a celebrity? Don't care. Maybe your favorite author? Probably not. How about a relative? It's getting warmer, right? Would you want to meet any biblical figure? Wouldn't that be awesome to see some of those? Would Jesus be the first person on the list? I'm fairly certain that a group of fishermen who were fishing in the Sea of Galilee never imagined that they would meet or see God in the flesh. And I'm almost positive that a young lady tending to her family responsibilities never expected to give birth to God's Son. If you were to ask these individuals what the most amazing sight they've ever seen, or what's the craziest experience they've ever had, I'm sure their encounters and interactions with Jesus, again, God in the flesh, would be top on their list. The problem they would have is to narrow it down to just one experience. And I'm confident that Jesus, God in the flesh, was not on their top ten people I want to meet the most list. Because the incarnation of Jesus, and when I say the incarnation of Jesus, I'm talking about God becoming a human being. It was not expected, it was difficult to come to terms with, and it was a complete shock and surprise. As we consider the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are considering the second movement in the gospel story. Remember last week we looked at the pre-existence of Jesus Christ as the word Jesus exists from eternity past. This morning we are looking at the incarnation of Jesus Christ. But first, I want us to be aware of, and I want us to let go of, this truncated gospel. I talked about it last week. I'm going to revisit it right now. We try to earn our salvation by doing good deeds. We know that Israel tried to obey the law of God, and we know that we try our hardest to obey God ourselves. The problem is, is that we sin and fall short of the glory of God. The good news is that Jesus dies for our sins. And so this truncated gospel would argue that we just need to believe and pray the prayer, ask Jesus into our hearts, and the gift of eternal life is ours today. You're going to go to heaven when you die because of that. Now hear me, some parts of this are true, right? We are sinners and God sends His Son to save us from our sin. But that's such a small slice, as important of a slice as it is, it's such a small slice of the gospel story. I look at the book of Acts, and I see no conversion prayer ever being prayed. I don't ever see anybody asking Jesus to come into their heart in any conversion experience in the book of Acts. Instead, I want us to embrace the eight movements of the full gospel. And by the full gospel, I'm talking about Jesus' pre-existence, his incarnation, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his appearances, his enthronement, and the return that he will bring. So we're in week two today. We're talking about the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The Word takes on human flesh. This is what I want you to know today. 
the pre-existent one faces life like we do. The pre-existent one faces life like we do. I don't know if you realize how profound that really is. That God would take on flesh and experience all of your struggles, all of your joys, all of your pain in Himself. And so God can identify with us because He experiences life just like we do. I think this is powerful. I think it encourages us, inspires us, and certainly captivates us. God says, I understand. Whatever you're going through, He can say, I understand. Because He faces life like we do in the person of Jesus Christ. So let's begin with the Gospel of John. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. We read that last week about the pre-existence. Check out verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Yes, we are reminded of His preexistence. But we are also reminded that He comes and He tabernacles among us. He pitches His tent with us. In other words, God is present with us in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, full of grace, full of truth. The very glory of God. And I would argue that His glory shines preeminent in His love. John wrote a gospel, but he also wrote three letters to the early church. This is how he starts his first letter. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life. Is that a reference to Jesus? The eternal life? It might be. Which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. As I briefly mentioned last week, the pre-existent one took on human flesh. They saw Him. They looked upon Him. They touched Him. Again, Jesus, God in the flesh. And so in writing these words, John is debunking docetism. Docetism is a form of Gnosticism. What in the world am I talking about? These were false teachings being propagated in the church. Basically saying that Jesus is not God in the flesh. That's the essence of the teaching, the false teaching. And if you continue to read John's letter, he will later call these people antichrists. Anybody who denies that Jesus did not come in the flesh or God did not come in the flesh. And so John reiterates, we touched him. We looked upon him. We saw him with our own eyes. This guy was real. Jesus, God in the flesh. And so as we consider, consider the incarnation of Jesus Christ this morning, I want to look at four experiences that provide validation. The first one is this. Jesus experiences creation like we do. It's kind of like a bigger, grander episode of Undercover Boss. Have you ever watched that show? I think I've seen one or two episodes. Hmm. I remember correctly, if I remember correctly, the TV show, the boss experiences his or her business or enterprise just like his or her employees do, right? And they don't know that their boss is in their midst, right? The boss is exposed to the employee's struggles and successes as they relate to work and family, relationships, finances, even health issues. It's easier to be sympathetic, is it not, when you are placed in the same context and sharing the same experience. I think, if I'm correct, the boss typically walks away with a greater appreciation of those that work for him or her, right? Does the incarnation of Jesus Christ mean that God appreciates us more because He faces life just like we do? I think it's a resounding yes. How does Jesus experience creation like we do? He experiences birth, does He not? Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. She will bear a son, you shall call His name Jesus, for He will save His people from their sins. The Holy Spirit impregnates Mary. We know that Jesus has no biological earthly father. 
Because God is His Father. And so the Virgin Mary births the Son of God. I find it so amazing, so incredible, that the very Creator of the universe subjects Himself to His own creation by experiencing birth just like we do. More than just that, He also experiences growth. I think it's one of the most amazing things a parent can do is watch their children grow up. It's one of the coolest things that we get to experience. Hey, Dad, I need another pair of cleats. What? I just bought you a pair of cleats. You need another pair of cleats? Come on, man. They grow out of their clothes. They grow out of their shoes. Hopefully, they grow out of their childlessness. childlessness whatever. Jesus grew up. Luke 2.52 And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. He grows taller. He grows in favor with God and men as He exhibits righteousness and purity. A great example. He also grows in wisdom, which comes with age and experience. More than that, Jesus also experiences a storm. Have you ever been caught out in a rainstorm or a windstorm? Yeah, there was this lady I went to a concert with in St. Louis a couple years ago, and we were rained on and poured on. There's nothing you can do about it. The Creator subjects Himself to His own creation. It's amazing because Jesus gets caught in a storm. Luke chapter 8, verse 22. One day He got into a boat with His disciples, and He said to them, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out. And as they sailed, He fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling, and they were filling with water and were in danger. I find it awesome that Jesus experiences life like we do. How cool is this? Even more, He experiences fatigue. Now, in my old age, I'm almost 48, I just don't fight it anymore because I can't fight it anymore. By 9 o'clock, my eyes are getting heavy. By 9.15, 9.30, I'm in bed doing my devotions. And when I'm done, I close my eyes and I'm gone. It doesn't take long. We experience fatigue, do we not? There are t moments when tiredness just overwhelms us. We just read about Jesus in the storm. Matthew gives us a little more detail. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. What does it say about Jesus? That he was asleep. What? Jesus has crashed out in the middle of the storm. They have to actually wake him up. Apparently the creator of the universe is a heavy sleeper. On a more serious note, we also know that Jesus experiences death. The death of Jesus Christ is our topic for next week. But here's just a glimpse of what Scripture says. Matthew chapter 27 and Luke chapter 23. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. To live is to die. And Jesus experienced it just like we do. He experiences creation just like we do. A second experience is this. Jesus experiences emotion like we do. Because God creates us with emotion, they must have a purpose. And so we have to be careful how we respond to life based on emotion and feeling. But they certainly still have value, right? What's the value of your emotions? They drive you into relationship, do they not? Do emotions drive you into relationships? Nobody wants to completely process an experience by themselves. They may want to sit with it for a little while, but there comes a time when we need somebody to talk to, somebody to listen, to give us advice, to encourage us, even to help us along the way. Why would God remove emotions from us when they drive us into a deeper relationship? And so our goal in life is not to be emotionless. It's to get to a place where we can process, express, and respond to our emotions in a way that honors and glorifies God. We did a study from Peter Scazzaro's book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, last year. He writes this, God made us as whole people in His image. 
That image includes physical, spiritual, emotional, intellectual, and social dimensions. Ignoring any aspect of who we are as men and women made in God's image always results in destructive consequences. Hmm. Let's look at a few emotions that Jesus experienced. He experienced anger, did He not? What in the world could cause Jesus to get mad? Matthew chapter 21, verse 12. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Why is He so mad? Because the money changers are exploiting God's people. If you were a poor individual and you needed to make a sacrifice at the temple, you would buy a pigeon. That's what you would do. And yet the money changers are charging too much money for these pigeons. And Jesus gets upset about that. And He says, you're turning my house into a den of robbers. You're exploiting the poor. Jesus also experiences sadness. What's your saddest moment? What is one of your saddest moments? It could be when you lose a loved one, right? It's not easy losing someone we've had a relationship with. When you experience that sadness, Jesus knows exactly how you feel. Because He faces life like we do. His friend Lazarus passes away, and Jesus speaks with his sister, and she's crestfallen. John 11, verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. <clears throat> and he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And then Jesus wept, right? He wasn't just moved and troubled. Do you see the words that are used here? He was deeply moved and greatly troubled. Jesus joins them in their weeping. He feels the weight of bereavement. He is near an emotional breaking point. More than just experiencing anger and sadness, he experiences frustration. Have people frustrated you? Come on, I know they have. You live in the same world I do. You know what? Jesus understands you when you are frustrated with people because they frustrated him as well. Matthew chapter 17, verse 14. <clears throat> and when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son. For he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they cannot heal him. And Jesus answered, sense the frustration in his voice. O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. Jesus is frustrated with his disciples. He does what they fail to do. I'm very grateful, however, that Jesus doesn't abandon these disciples or replace these disciples. He simply expresses His frustration. We also learn from Scripture that He experiences joy. What is it that makes you rejoice in this world? What makes Jesus rejoice? Check out Luke chapter 10, verse 21. In the same hour, He rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank You, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. What is it that Jesus rejoices in? It is the will of His Father being accomplished. A final emotion we notice from Jesus is that He experiences fear. Can you remember your most scariest moment? Can you remember those experiences that caused you to be afraid? Jesus understands you. He experiences fear as well. Luke chapter 22, verse 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. It looks like another emotional breaking point for Jesus. If you've been there, he's been there too. Agony, earnest prayer, sweat like blood. It's an excruciating moment for Jesus. Because He knows the crucifixion is near. If you think you're a bit emotional, Jesus was a bit emotional as well. 
A third experience is that Jesus experiences temptation like we do. Have you ever been tempted before? That's probably the dumbest question a preacher could ask a congregation, isn't it? Have you ever been tempted before? Of course you've been tempted before, because I've been tempted before, and just like me, you've given in to that temptation. We are tempted by what Albert Haas calls the empty peas. Pleasure, praise, power, prestige, position, popularity, people, productivity, possessions, and perfection. And then you throw in greed and lust and envy and pride and gluttony. They're all combatants on the spiritual journey. What temptation have you given into? What is your weakness? What is your struggle? Each of us has our own temptation. And as we consider Jesus as God in the flesh, we must not overlook the reality that He was tempted as well. He can identify with us. We read in the letter of Hebrews, one of my most favorite texts in Scripture, Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, and in the caveat, yet without sin. Everything that you experience, he experienced. He faces life just like we do. And He can sympathize with us. The difference is, He never gave in. He lived a perfect life, a sin-free life. In Matthew, we receive insight into specifics of His temptations. Let's look at two of them. He is tempted to be selfish. Matthew chapter 4, verse 2. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, He was hungry. I'm hungry after five hours. 40 days and 40 nights. And the tempter came and said to Him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. It would be hard for me to resist food after one day. I can't imagine being hungry for 40 days. And yet Jesus overcomes the temptation. He remains faithful to the purpose, leaving us an example. He's also tempted to take a shortcut. Have you ever taken a shortcut in life? Have you been tempted to take a shortcut? Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. A simple act of bowing down and worshiping the devil. And Jesus could have all the glory that he wanted to have. What did it require of Jesus to receive the glory that he finally received? It required death, suffering, humiliation, all of that. He could have shortcutted that. He could have done an end around and said, I don't really want to do any of that. All I have to do is bow down, worship the devil, and it will be given to me instantly. And yet Jesus says, no, we worship God and we worship God alone. He understands our struggles, ladies and gentlemen. A third, our fourth and final experience, Jesus experiences humiliation like we do. Humiliation. What's your most humiliating experience? Perhaps you've been humiliated by a boss who spoke down to you in front of your coworkers. Maybe it's someone at school who bullied you, or maybe a teacher that embarrassed you. <clears throat> maybe it's a friend who humiliated you by revealing something personal to a group of people. Maybe your spouse has humiliated you in front of your kids, your family, or a group of friends. If you've ever spent any amount of time around people, you've had a humiliating, embarrassing experience. I'm here to tell you that Jesus knows what you experienced because His identity is misrepresented. Have you ever been misrepresented? People say things about you that aren't true. When that happens, please know that Jesus understands. We read about one occasion in the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 3, verse 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. It is ludicrous, but it's happening. People are misrepresenting Jesus, his identity, because they want to quell the following that he has gathered. They are jealous, they're intimidated, and they're insecure. 
call it whatever you want. People misrepresented Jesus. People are going to misrepresent you. You know that you have one who sympathizes with you. And then maybe his greatest experience of humiliation comes at the end of his life. He is mistreated. Utterly, profoundly, deeply mistreated. I'm not going to read the chapters from Matthew, but you can look at them, chapter 26 and 27. But understand this. Jesus was betrayed, arrested, denied, put on trial, convicted, mocked, and crucified. And when he was crucified, he probably didn't have any clothes on. Talk about a humiliating experience. All demonstrations of the abuse that he endures from friends, from opponents, from religious and political authorities, and even the crowd in general. If you've ever been humiliated, understand that Jesus knows exactly what you've experienced because He's been humiliated too. The pre-existent One. The pre-existent One. He feels life like we do. He's familiar with the ups and downs. He knows the good and the bad. He's experienced success and the struggles of life. So what's the craziest thing you've ever experienced? What's the most amazing thing you've ever seen? Who is the person that you would most want to meet? For a group of fishermen, it's Jesus. For the women disciples, it is Jesus. As God in the flesh, Jesus unravels every preconception. When God visits our planet, nothing will ever be the same. The incarnation of Jesus is the second movement in the Gospel story. He arrives to fulfill all righteousness. He ushers in the kingdom of God. And He desires to bring people back into a relationship with His Father through the Spirit. And a key part of that purpose, as we're going to look at next week, was His death on the cross. But right now, we're going to celebrate it. We're going to take communion. You're going to be passed a tray of juice representing His blood. You're going to be passed a tray of bread which represents His body. These are emblems that remind us of what He has accomplished for us. And through that death, we have forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. God, we are so grateful, so thankful, so amazed that You would come to us in the flesh and experience life like we do to feel it and to face it. And Jesus accomplishes something that we or no human could ever accomplish. And that's to die a perfect death after living a perfect life. And because of that, we have eternal life, we have salvation, we have spirit, we have a relationship with you. We are grateful for that. We pause, we celebrate in Jesus' name.